Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to a continuation of this new series that we're doing myself here uh, in the studio with uh, my brother Anthony Rogers, and it's about the doctrine of the Trinity from the Old Testament. So far, we have shown that there are rich passages in the Old Testament that mention the members of the Trinity sometimes, all of them in one passage, two of them in another passage. But also last time, we began to show you the different descriptions or titles that are given to them. Today, we'll continue with the same concept. Anthony, welcome back, brother, and uh, let us uh, know where are we headed today in terms of biblical passages. Yeah, so re recall that last time we looked at Isaiah 63, 7 through 14, a very rich text because it talks about God's deliverance of the people from Egypt by means of the angel of his presence and his Holy Spirit. And there we, we started to look specifically at the angel of the Lord a little bit more, and we saw that another title used for him in that section is the arm of the Lord. So we've looked at several passages, especially in Isaiah, I think we looked only at passages in Isaiah, where the arm of the Lord is not just a figurative expression, but seems to be a title for a person. It speaks of God's arm descending. It speaks of God's arm ruling for him. But in particular, it associates the arm of the Lord and his saving activity with Israel's redemption from Egypt. And we, we saw these interesting expressions like he mm -hmm. destroyed Rahab, and he uh, looks like Rahab, right? Like, right. Uh, but it's not talking about her. God wasn't an enemy of Rahab. She was a believer, right? He saved Rahab at the, at the conquest of Jericho. But this is talking about when God dried up the sea. Somehow in that event, he destroyed Rahab. And it also associates this with God destroying the serpent or the dragon. And that's, that's very interesting. Um, and so uh, to sort of... Uh, fill that out more today, uh, there are several other passages that help us see more of what was going on there. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the first slide that we have, for example, in Job 26, uh, notice what it says here. It says, the pillars of, the heaven, uh, of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. He quieted the sea with his power, so it's referring to the Exodus, and by his understanding he shattered Rahab. Again, you have this idea of God destroying Rahab at the, the deliverance of the people from the sea. Then it goes on, by his breath the heavens are cleared, his hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. Again, a reference to the serpent. Behold, these are the fringes of his ways, and how faint a word we hear of him, but his mighty thunder, who can understand? And so again, you have this... Uh, uh, association of these ideas, the destruction of Rahab, the deliverance from the sea, and the fleeing serpent. Uh, this passage doesn't mention the arm of the Lord, but uh, we've seen these things also associated with the arm of the Lord in other passages. And here, so it just sort of establishes a pattern. These things go together somehow. So if we move to the next slide, uh, things become even more clear. Uh, this is Psalm 89, 8 through 10, where it says, O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the swelling of the sea. There's right. a reference to the sea again. When its waves rise, you still them. You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. So there's the arm of the Lord again. God somehow defeated Rahab at uh, the deliverance of Israel from the sea and did so by his mighty arm. So the, the idea that God's arm, mentioned by Isaiah as another way of referring to the angel, uh, was somehow active at the sea is not a new idea. Isaiah is not making it up. That's right. Every Israelite would have recognized this, this language. Correct. Uh, and, and I think in the next slide we're going to get to know now Rahab, you know, that right. is being mentioned here. So shall we go to Isaiah 30? Yeah. Let's look so at that passage. In, in this passage now, uh, people can see clearly uh, that the mention of Rahab is there as well. Right. And here we don't need to read the, the whole uh, passage, but it's talking about people uh, going somewhere. And then verse 7 becomes very clear. It says, even Egypt, whose help is vain and empty. So people are going to Egypt for help, and the Lord says her help is worthless, right? right. And then it says, therefore... I have called her Rahab. It's very clear. Has, I have called Egypt Rahab. Right. You know, that's basically what's going on here. Right. Yeah. So, so when we now look back at all those passages about the arm of the Lord destroying Rahab at the destruction uh, or the deliverance of Israel, it's it's a way of referring to Egypt. Right. And so the association. This is this is helpful. I think in in other ways, not just for the doctrine of the Trinity, but you have the association of Egypt or Rahab with the serpent. 
Right? This shows that the devil is himself active through this evil power, the, the uh, Egypt, right? Right. And so back of Egypt's uh, uh, efforts at enslaving Israel and, uh, you know, persecuting her and afflicting her is the devil himself. And so when the Lord comes to deliver the people from Egypt, he's also defeating Satan in that, uh, in the course of that. And this is really significant because when you, when you go back to that first promise in Genesis 3.15 of the gospel, it, remember Satan has tempted mankind and brought mankind now into sin and captivity. And God makes a promise that he's going to defeat Satan. He's going to crush the serpent's head by means of one of the woman's descendants, her seed. And we know that ultimately that's that's the Messiah, right? right. And, and that's that actually leads us into this next slide where, where things really become interesting. Which is Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Mo most people will recognize Isaiah 53 as the, a classic messianic text. Right. Isaiah 53 is that text that talks about the, the suffering of the Messiah. The Messiah is going to suffer, but not for his own sins. He's going to suffer on behalf of the sins of his people. But this that section actually begins in chapter 52, right? And so if you remember, uh, one of the passages that we read about the arm of the Lord is actually in Isaiah 51. Correct. So ju just in the vicinity of Isaiah, uh, this prophecy about Messiah, we've already been reminded about the arm of the Lord. So if we start here, notice what it says about the Messiah. Behold, my servant will prosper. So the Messiah is going to come and be a servant, even though he's, just, he's identified as a divine person in the Old Testament. Here he's coming as a servant. So, so here he is right here. Right. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. Uh, so, uh, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations, kings will shut their mouths on account of him, for what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not uh, heard they will understand. You remember that passage earlier where it talks about God's arm will descend and will right. be seen? Right. Here's, here is Isaiah uh, using some of the same language. He hasn't spoken of the arm of the Lord yet, but he's going to. But you're already given something of a, of a tip-off, right? right. Uh, so if we move now to the very next uh, slide. It, this time we're going to look at Isaiah 53. Right. Now this, so people know, this is a continuation of what we were just reading. Correct. Yeah, it's immediately right after that passage in Isaiah 52. Right. So uh, here it says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now note the connection. It goes on to say, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. So we're talking about a person here. Right. Right, and, and uh, that person, notice it's the arm of the Lord, but somehow he's now being identified as the servant. And our, Isaiah is saying, who has believed our report? In other words, who's believed this message? Right. right? We're, we're proclaiming the coming of the arm of the Lord as a servant, and he's growing up before him like, you know, how's this arm of the Lord who is already there at the destruction and overturning of Egypt and the deliverance of the people, how now are we talking about him growing up? You know, this message is, is, is curious to people. They, they, they hear it and they wonder at it. You know, who has believed this? And that's exactly what we see when Jesus comes, isn't it? People Amen. marvel over him and they say, how does this man speak this way? Where did he get this wisdom? How does he perform such works? Right? He, he's, a, he's a puzzle to them. He can't possibly be God, could he? Right, uh, but that's that's exactly what Isaiah is prophesying in Isaiah 53. He's identifying the angel of the Lord who first delivered Israel from Egypt with the Messiah, the coming servant uh, prophesied by Isaiah. Let's take a look at uh, you know uh, this is our last slide for today, and um, you know here you begin to see also the person of Christ, the Messiah, emerging even right. clearer. Right. So this this is a uh, this ties in with Isaiah fifty three because remember it says uh, uh, who has believed our report to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him a tender shoot. Well, here this is the same term used for the Messiah. It says in Isaiah eleven, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. That's the father of David, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. 
Now, remember in Isaiah 63, when it talks about God saving Israel, it says he did so by means of the angel of the Lord and his spirit. But then we saw that the angel of the Lord, the arm of the Lord, is going to become the servant and, and uh, come into the world. And again, the spirit is associated with this activity, right? Right, right. In Isaiah 11. So you see that it's, it's the same pattern. God saved his people in the past in this way, and he's going to do the same thing in the future in a more glorious way, but it's going to be by means of his angel and his spirit. That's great, and, and you know, if, uh, if anyone tuning in, you know, you, you've been watching basically um, uh, one of these episodes for this series that we're going through myself and Anthony Rogers on the doctrine of the Trinity of the Old, uh, in the Old Testament. So far, we have demonstrate uh, demonstrated from these passages the members of the Trinity and the different names, and uh, today's uh, episode highlighted also the person of Christ in a variety of ways and uh, the way that he was being introduced by. Isaiah. Tell us more, brother, about what to expect next time. Okay, so next time we'll look a little bit more at the Spirit. So these first several episodes, the idea has been uh, pretty much introductory, but there's so much more to say of course. from the Old Testament regarding each person. So uh, we'll look a little more at what Isaiah says about the Spirit, and then uh, after that we'll start delving more deeply into what the Old Testament says about the Father what it says about the Son or the angel of the Lord, and what it says about the Spirit. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, hopefully everybody is going to make every effort to uh, watch uh, the previous uh, videos, if this is your first time, of course. And if you've been watching them, hopefully you made an effort to even watch it more than once, take notes, and continue, of course, to watch any of our future videos for this particular episode. By the time we're done, we hope that we have given you at least enough information to substantiate the existence of such doctrine in Old Testament and to see why the New Testament was building upon what was already there. Any other last comments, brother? No, looking forward to next time. Me too. Thank you so much. Till we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.